CAC uh, member. Um, we will be, this will be unlocking multiple years of uh, work to be able to validate and prove the architecture that we're going to establish. That UTM services uh, that will leverage uh, connectivity services from TELUS, uh, starting with 4G and ultimately, ultimately moving into 5G. And so this will be uh, years of work. It has been uh, months of work up to now. Uh, in recent weeks, it's been uh, uh, the field deployment and testing and validation out here in Alberta near Josephsburg and on both on the public services that TELUS offer and the private services that now uh, we uh, can bring to the market. So the U energy UTM trials will be a three-year project. Uh, and first, can it focus on connected drones, then uh, detect and avoid capabilities, and then ultimately uh, talking about autonomy. We'll showcase today, uh, sir, uh, the start of autonomous uh, drone operations and you'll see some uh, object recognition capabilities that we can that we're preparing to bring to the market you'll also see uh, a connected drone uh, fly uh, right after this our vision for the energy utm trials is first establishing a pipeline corridor between josephsburg and uh, fort mcmurray that's required because of the infrastructure that needs to be uh, put in place it needs to be uh, exist and needs to be validated and what it ultimately comes down to is hundreds of hours of flight operations to be able to validate uh, the reliability of those services uh, and the uh, ultimately the utm infrastructure so uh talking talking about uh the next go to the next slide jeremy please so what does the infrastructure look like? It's ultimately having a, a connected drone, establishing uh, data, sending data with uh, cooperative, uh, cooperative traffic and integrating non-cooperative traffic. We also need to be able to establish those data flows from the drone, uh, three, three levels be able to send uh, information, position information, and interface with the UTM system, the unmanned traffic management system, but then also provide command and control services for the drone. And then the most important thing to the people on this call is the data, the, the data that is are ultimately going to change your business processes and drive the real value from uh, drones. So with that, uh, that's a quick overview of the architecture. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to hand it over to Mark Dubruel, who's our chief pilot, and I'd like him to provide a little bit of background and backdrop of the facilities here today and the flight operations that we're going to conduct here uh, shortly. And I'm going to go on mute and let Mark uh, transition. Uh, good morning, folks. Good morning, everyone. Uh, in case it hasn't actually been explained, uh, I'm actually not at Josephberg location. I'm at our uh, facility in uh, in Edmonton, close to the Northlands Coliseum. Uh, I'll be piloting the drone this morning. Uh, legally, Lindsay will be the visual observer and the safety pilot, and he's going to be on location about 30 kilometers away from the drone. So this demonstration is going to be all through cellular connectivity. Uh, I'm just going to be uh, sharing my screen. Just give me a moment, folks. Uh, there's a few different uh, uh, I'll the map. I'll, put, I'll take the map down. Oh, perfect. OK, you, you can actually see this in the distance. And it's about 30 to 40 kilometers away. Um, uh, the flight ops center, uh, the star on the left, that's where I'm actually piloting from, and uh, the uh, it's kind of a little bit messy, but the field ops office on the right and the grouping of points we have on the right side uh, is where Lindsay's located. Uh, the uh, UTM and the trailer is almost explicitly where he is tra the, the, uh, located, um, close to the rail line and the little sub window on the right. 
And just give me a moment, folks. Do you want me to stop sharing? Do you want the screen now, Mark? Uh, yeah, I'm going to bring over uh, my screen share. You have the screen. Okay, I have a few windows, and my setup here for piloting the drone, uh, because we're in the uh, development stage, there is a lot of stuff as a pilot and as a developer we need to monitor. Uh, I'm going to go over from some of the technologies that we're using. First and foremost, one of the one of the holy grails in the dry in the drone world is going to be the fully autonomous drone. We want data. We hit a button just as easily as we ask Siri for the weather. Uh, we want to be able to ask a drone to give us the data that we need. But and the reality is that's a long ways away. Uh, the other reality is that is we still need uh, a pilot in the loop uh, for the drone operations. Uh, one of the first steps we're going to do is actually look at the area we're going to be flying. Uh, FlySafe gives us a very good uh, overview of the area and the location. From this, we can actually see a good amount of the surrounding airspace and all of the aviation hazards that we're going to have. In this case, we can see the uh, center of all the dashed lines under my mouse is where Lindy is located. We have a, a quick overview. We have, can see the Josephberg Airport. We can see some heliports that are co-located. We can see some, some um, alert airspace uh, up above and another group of alert airspace closer to Redwater. Uh, from here, we gain a lot of Nav Canada information uh, Mark, in specific. Point, sorry. Yep. Just in case people don't know, uh, <clears throat> FlySafe is the Air Market's really first initiative. Um, it's being adopted by the RCMP, and we've sold it to Hydro Quebec and to Tech Resources, among some other people. Yep, good point. Um, it's a it's a good product. It it does a lot of the flight planning we are going to be using. Uh, there's a lot of contact information. All of this information is generated automatically within the FlySafe database uh, for the pilot. Uh, from there, it's going to be uh, pushed over to traffic management software, uh, and specifically, this is UTMSphere, another air market initiative that we're working with. Uh, air, you can almost think of you, the, the uh, traffic management as air traffic control for drones. So, uh, just to be clear, so ETM is here, was developed by our partners, Exponent Technology Services, that I mentioned before. Um, I just want to give them a, a clear shout out. Great people. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, with the UTM sphere, I have actually a previous flight that we've already loaded. There's, there's two ways of looking at the UTM sphere. You can look at the live tracking, the permissions, giving the authorization to actually do a flight in the airspace. Um, on top of that, there's actually a recording, just like uh, you hear about Nav Canada having to review radar logs, radio logs. We can do the same thing from UTM sphere. What I actually have up right now is the previous flight Lindsay and I did this morning. You can actually see the altitude and speed readouts over on the left-hand side as I move the scroll. And you can see the position of the drone relative to its actually planned and flown flight path. I'm just sort of going through quickly through this previous flight so you can see uh, what we've done previously. From that, the other thing we're actually capturing is cellular information as well through our partner in TELUS and through our partner uh, at uh, XB station we're actually capturing all the cellular information from the channels the operator codes the RSSIs and the actual towers so we can look back uh, looking at the cellular connectivity last piece of the pie right now or the piece of the puzzle part of me we're looking at is the cellular connectivity we're using an application developed in-house at uh, air market called sky data link this is our connection to the drone 
from here, we can actually see uh, the signal status, the serial status. We can control the camera on board the drone. And more importantly, we can actually see the network status in real time. When I mean the network status, I mean the actual TELUS public band, uh, public LTE network. We have a lot of specifics that we can view. We can view the IP of the drone. We can view the access technology that we're using. In this case is uh, LTE. We can start to view the band. We're actually at the point now where we're starting to experiment with the cellular connectivity, trying to optimize the cellular connectivity. It's very important on a legal aspect that we have command and control link reliability. Um, it's actually going to be a requirement in the beyond visual line of sight regulations. And that is what we're working on and developing and confirming and validating right now. Um, again, it's very, uh, very developmental stage, so I won't go too much farther into that. Uh, I'm actually going to drop out of that, and I'm going to be sharing my next screen, which is the actual uh, drone uh, piloting software, uh, the ground control software. Just give me a moment, folks. All right, right now we're actually looking at um, Mission Planner, which we're going to be using to pilot the drone this morning with a live camera feed. This camera feed is actually streaming in real time over the LTE network. We have already uh, planned the flight. We have loaded the waypoints to the drone. Uh, there's not much more for us to do right now. Lindsay, uh, unless there's uh, anything specifically you want me to review in the GCS software, we're pretty close to actually uh, running the before takeoff checklist and uh, launching the drone if you think it's a good time weather-wise to launch. Yes, we're confirmed, Mark. We, uh, we're good to go. We want to go All through right. the checklist now. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, valid f finish off the uh, GCS checklist starting voltage. 23 volts, sufficient for flights. Waypoint missions have been updated. Home position is updated. And uh, current mode is verified and loiter. All right, Lindsay, are you ready for the before takeoff checklist? Just one side, just to be clear. The rest of the ECS checklist Mark had done right before you all came on. Confirmed. Okay. Yep. Go ahead, Mark. Okay. Before we start the checklist, just want to confirm you have the RC receiver throttle on idle. Confirmed. And in right. your hand. Yep. takeoff checklist, GPS mounted and secure. Confirmed. Arms locked six times. Confirmed. Propeller, six unfolded. Confirmed. Propeller condition, six good. Confirmed. Batteries, three secure connected. Yeah, confirmed. Sparkless connector connected. Confirmed. Sky data link, secure with zip ties. Confirmed. Uh, gimbal uh, secured and uh, disconnected. Confirmed. Camera is on and transmitting. Hardware safety switch activate and advise in solid red. Okay. Okay, Mark. It's armed. Okay, make your VHF broadcast on one twenty three decimal five. Hold tight, okay. Just for traffic, this is Airtel 2, an unmanned drone operating two miles east of the aerodrome, up to 200 feet for the next 10 minutes. Josephberg Air Traffic, Airtel 2. It's clear, Mark. Thanks, takeoff area flight path, advise when clear. Yep, you're good, Mark. 
Arming, advise when Perfect. proper spinning. Spinning, Mark. Taking off. Take off. Five meters. Check. Landing gear up. Check. So what you're saying is a total simulation for beyond visual line of sight flight. Mark is 60 kilometers away. So coming into the frame in the top right is the actual uh, TELUS private LTE trailer. You can see the mast in the trailer, and it's a bit of a secan. It's dropping off to the right side of the screen. When it comes back, you'll have a much better view of the uh, private LTE trailer. Winds are minimal. Check. Aircraft is returning. Confirmed. Folks, what you're seeing in the uh, video is a compressor station, a uh, pipeline compressor station uh, near Joseberg. I think there's mid midstream. Hey, Lindsay, RTL is started. Okay, confirmed. Right in the center of the screen is the ACO, or sorry, the uh, the CCAN and the uh, the private LTE trailer. Final descent started. Confirm landing area is clear. It's clear, Mark. In position. Landing gear coming down. Check. Ten meters. Check. Ten meters. Confirm the gear is down. Confirm. Five meters. Check. Three meters. Check. One meter. Check. Touchdown. Aircraft is disarmed. Hardware safety switch. Eyes on blinking. Okay. Confirm blinking. All right, let's see. Clear to disconnect batteries at your uh, discretion. Okay. Well, uh, We'll transition into the um, the next part of the demonstration right now. Okay, I'm gonna unshare my screen at this point. Okay, so folks, that's uh, that you've seen a flight operation, uh, flight operations being conducted over the uh, pr uh, public LTE system. Um, it very uh, went successfully without uh, any glitches, which is great. Uh, we'd like to be able to, Farouk, if you can bring up your screen now and share um, what we want to talk about now and share is the AI capabilities, the ability for autonomous uh, anomaly detection. And so what is the screen coming up? There, there we, we go. Are. Okay, freeze. Okay, uh, so what you're seeing here, folks, is you're seeing uh, object recognition. 
inside of the flight mission uh, planning uh, software. So this is uh, coming directly from our, uh, the, the drone uh, that is um, positioned at our flight operations center. The camera is recognizing the truck in the background, and you can also see it is recognizing our, uh, our person, our live, uh, live demo there. And so what this brings is it brings the capability to automatically detect objects and then ultimately detect L uh, anomalies. So that's where we will be progressing our capabilities next is to be able to fly over the uh, 4G LTE services, be managed under the air traffic control for drones, UTM system, and then be able to deliver uh, fit for purpose business solutions using uh, object recognition. And so what I'd like to do now is have Farouk uh, go to the uh, simulation and uh, talk about the implementation of this technology on a drone, which we will start to uh, start to simulate here with our energy UTM trials pipeline uh, surveillance. But uh, we wanted to showcase what the simulation is doing now and how we'll move, uh, continue to move this technology forward. Fruit, can you start the? Yes, for sure. Hello, everybody. Thanks. Yes, thank you, everybody, for joining this session. My name is Farouk. I'm an electrical and instrumentation engineer working with Lindsay on developing the technology. So this simulation I'm going to demonstrate right now showcases the ability of the drone to recognize objects. So basically what I'm going to demonstrate now is that the, an autonomous drone is going to fly through some points and it is going to recognize a human. And when the human is recognized, it will show it on the map. So on the left hand side, you are seeing an, you are seeing an overview of the map. And on the right hand side, you are seeing the camera feed on the drone. So I'm going to start the a mission right now. So on the left hand side, you will see that there are some points that the drone is going to fly through under this, uh, beside that and under this uh, Eiffel Tower. And on the right hand side, you are seeing the camera feed from the drone. So the, as you see on the left hand side on the map, the drone is autonomously flying from the beginning, from the home to the to, to the first point. And on the right hand side, you are seeing the, the, the camera feed. So the drone will fly through some points and as soon as it can identify the human, it will display the human on the map on the left hand side. And you are going to see the, see the human on the camera feed on the right hand side. So right now in, in the uh, camera view, it's looking for objects and it's looking for a human and it's uh, programmed to automatically stop uh, the drone uh, as soon as it finds a simulated uh, person. So you can see the person walking off to the side. You haven't, it hasn't detected it yet. Yes, now it's being the human is detected. So you see on the left hand side that the map is showing that a human is detected. And on the right hand side, the camera feed is showing that the human is watching. So we are going to extend these capabilities for whatever purpose that the customers request. For example, on a pipeline to detect anomalies like unauthorized construction or gas leakage, or if the gas leaks, it affects the surrounding vegetation and we can identify this, this anomalies, unauthorized construction, bare vegetation or leakage through this uh, autonomous drone and image recognition capabilities. So at this point, the mission ends.
So, yes, as Farouk uh, uh, articulates that um, this, this demonstrates the, the capability that we originally exposed, uh, that was shown. Um, we are working towards uh, first making this uh, fit for purpose for here in Alberta and in for our energy UTM trials specifically. We'll be starting to do simulations, uh, simulated use cases for pipeline inspections to begin with. But then we will uh, expand that out as we uh, bring more drones on and uh, bring this capability to the, that fleet of drones to be able to fly beyond line of sight. And we are working uh, closely with TELUS to be able to bring that capability into the Energy UTM trials. And we expect to start that in the September, October timeframe. So uh, with that in mind, that's all the, the technology demonstrations that we had planned for today. Um, we, we've showcased how the energy UTM trials fit into the national stage and how uh, we plan to help build and deliver uh, BV loss capabilities based off of uh, cellular connectivity, uh, which delivers uh, unmanned traffic management, which then can empower businesses uh, with the technology that we just demonstrated here, like uh, AI uh, and object recognition to be able to fit, make it fit for purpose for their business uh, requirements. So uh, I think with that, Jeremy, I'll hand it back to you. Do you yeah. field any questions? I'm sure. going to stop sharing this screen. Yeah, thanks, Bert. So um, thank you very much, everybody. We've got lots of time for questions. What we've tried to show you here, um, we have a range of technologies. I, hopefully you're starting to see how they will come together. Um, <clears throat> systems integration is a very challenging job, but you can see the pieces are coming closer and closer together. Now, <clears throat> once you have something like Sky Data Link, how all this can work together as one coherent system. That's where our market is heading with lots of support from our strategic partners like Telus and Exponent. Um, <clears throat> as I said before, we wouldn't be here without doing this with PTAC and we wouldn't be doing the same as now from Alberta Innovates. Really want to say thank you again. But we have uh, <clears throat> 20 minutes for questions. We've got Lindsay, Mark, Farouz, uh, we're all here. If you have any questions, please speak up. Here's a, something's on chat. No? Are you, are you planning to implement edge technology at the sensor or where does the differentiation in observations come in? Yeah, so right now this is on the edge. Uh, where exactly does it end up uh, on the edge versus uh, on the, the telco side? We need to explain. Lizzie, you just dropped off. Uh, explore that but right now it's on the edge and uh, can you hear me jeremy yeah you're you're back Stanley, if i can add one more point to that a lot of that is going to depend on the specific level of connectivity wherever you are it's going to be different my use case um if you have to on the edge can you do it further back in the system what's going to be feasible, what's going to be more and less expensive, there will have to be a bit of flexibility built in there. Uh, maybe uh, if I can tap in Alexander from TELUS. Uh, so just, uh, uh, we were exploring together with their market uh, uh, where some of those post-processing capabilities should be hosted. So within a trailer that you have seen, we'll certainly have it uh, right on spot. Uh, but we also have a capabilities to uh, host the uh, uh, application softwares uh, in our um, NFVI environment and also uh, down the road also in our uh, multi-access edge computing environment, which kind of 
could bring this processing very close to the edge, uh, uh, certainly to avoid this uh, overly centralized model. So some of this sensing data for processing would require uh, a very reliable, uh, a very uh, a close by environment. So deployment models are flexible enough and would depend on a, on a use case uh, and would depend also on the customer needs. But we thought through that uh, to some extent so far. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? No other questions? Uh, Jim, what, what altitude were we flying at for the, uh, for the trial there? Was that 400 feet? No, th those were that was flown today at thirty meters, roughly a hundred feet. Oh, okay. And the the reason I'm asking is, as uh, the field of view isn't very wide at the altitude you're flying, so that that'll be, um, you know, obviously if we're flying higher, that field of view is going to get wider. Some of our pipeline corridors um, in the trial area it's not wide, but with some of our systems where we've got five forty-two inch pipelines in the corridor, that their corridor gets quite wide. Right, so keep that and keep that keep uh, that in mind. Absolutely, we are keeping that in mind. We're actually working with uh, different uh, focal lengths lenses right now, uh, but just for the trials, we're anticipating flying the corridor initially at 400 feet. The reason why we picked that altitude is because we are less of a hazard to traditional aviation at 400 feet, so we're using that as our starting benchmark. I ultimately, for the cameras and the field of view, we would like to operate at uh, at, at a thousand feet. Uh, but initially, on the first few first phases of the trial, we're anticipating only being able to fly at uh, 400 feet. So we're working on developing the technology and optimizing the field of view for that altitude. And and yes, today it was done well below 400 feet. And there's a few reasons for doing that. Uh, but we're, we're the bottom line is that we're working on the different focal lengths, different sensors, to giving us the best field of view. Yeah, thank you, Mark. Yeah, I think Stanley. Part of that is solving multiple levels of challenges. So there's the actual um, the actual monitoring challenge. Then there's the competitivity challenge. Yeah. The first order is the regulatory challenge. We have to make sure Transport Canada is totally comfortable with each step of the way. Yeah, I understand. Bring them up with us. And then they're, you know, they love the walk, the, the crawl, walk, run. We're, we're with them on that. Yeah, I understand. I understand. That's us too. <laughs> <laughs> Just to add, Jer Jeremy was actually pointing out the the idea that the, the connectivity is a challenge too, and it is. Uh, and we're discovering that the, the connectivity is a challenge. All the cell phone networks, and perhaps someone can tell us from can elaborate, but all the cell phone technology is optimized for someone driving in a car two meters above the surface of the earth. So when we're getting into the drone technology, we're venturing into new space with that. There's a lot of experimentation. So when we chose 400 feet as a benchmark. We also realize that that's the point where we're going to optimize the TELUS connectivity software as well and beam with. If we started saying, hey, we're going to fly these drones at 1,000 feet, TELUS would have a much more challenge trying to keep our connectivity involved with that. So that's the, one of the other uh, connectivity benchmarks we're working with with, uh, uh, w with the choice of altitudes. Mark Godin, you have no questions for us? Uh, thank you, Jeremy. So, uh, yeah, so my, 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 I didn't, wasn't thinking of asking questions, but now that you uh, brought it up. So what's your next step here? Are, are we, uh, so Lindsay mentioned uh, more trials in September, October. Is that the next? The next uh, time we'll hear about progress. Mm, no, so so good good point to bring it up. Uh, we're, it's it's continued uh, flight testing and uh, connectivity testing. Mark, we need to bring. Um, we've showcased some uh, capabilities, but we need to integrate that and make that flight uh, aware and aware um, operational. And while we are uh, proving or getting ready to do the energy UTM trials, we need to establish the connectivity through the initial stages of the flight area. 
the proposed flight area. So you'll see in uh, over the coming uh, weeks, um, the actual drone actually flying and actually capturing, uh, doing that object recognition from the air and then validation of the connectivity through the proposed corridor to be able to validate and support the application that we have in front of uh, transport right now. Awesome. That sounds uh, really good. Uh, Alexander, again, uh, I think Stanley had an uh, uh, answer from uh, uh, Air Market's point of view regarding uh, uh, what are the challenges on the cellular network. We have anticipated some of those. Uh, we have actually run to see like how the 2D uh, modeling would work uh, for pretty much a 3D type of use case. And we already recognized that uh, there was something that could be done uh, through the traditional engineering that uh, uh, we can, as it tells us, proceed in a radio, radio access network capacity. But also there are some interesting solutions out there uh, that are already uh, available uh, that automatize part of that uh, job for us to, to kind of uh, give us the, the 3D model the pattern of the best flight to keep the guaranteed uh, uh, seat to link performances, and, and we're also asking for a video performance uh, uh, reliability as much as possible. So uh, this is also something that we are uh, kind of planning on and recognize would be needed in the context of PTAC trials. Hey, Mark, that's, uh, that's a great answer. Thank you very much. Mark, I mean, in terms of the work, so we have those pieces for increasing integration. There's solving problems like the regulatory activity, working with different partners. So it's like a, a multi-layered issue, always small pieces moving forward. And in the, uh, Jeremy and, and uh, Lindsay, in the next, uh, this summer, I guess, I, I, I believe we will be planning to have more one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with uh, the, the people on the call today about their application and any particular other technical issue that might be relevant to their applications. That, that's plan. Yeah, yeah. 100% correct. Yeah, we would, we would expect that uh, showcasing the validation uh, of what we exposed today will uh, kickstart some, uh, some ideas within the organizations and they'll be reach out and then we can hone uh, what they're needing and ultimately drive that towards a simulation environment and then an actual environment uh, proof proof of concept which would uh, could could be incorporated into the bigger plans of the energy utm trials Very does good. that make sense yep any other questions for anybody else we have lots of people on the call all those sorts of people have different interest issues. We can deal with them specifically with SkyD Link or Energy UTM, or we can handle other drone issues. We've got some telecoms people from Telesandal questions too. If you have questions for them as well, any questions you have, please speak up. Hey, uh, this is uh, Bavyang Shukla from Imperial Oil. Um, just looking at the connectivity, uh, specifically LTE, uh, we all know that uh, up at north, uh, we have a challenging connectivity landscape in there. There, Not all the areas are well connected. So tell us, is the best in that area, but not all the areas. Say, for example, if I talk on behalf of Imperial's curl, we have the coverage of the curl. And uh, as soon as we exit curl's lease, we'll have the zero coverage. So... Uh, what are the plans or what what's the the plan to provide the coverage uh, beyond that uh, existing coverage areas? Is it something like uh, mobilizing additional trailers for, for the flight times or like how? So uh, thanks for the question. I, I, can you guys can I see my video right now? Yes. Yes, I can see that, Lindsay. Yeah, so... Um, Again, working with our strategic partners, tell us this is a, a kit that was stood up, private LTE services. And so this can be brought to uh, facilitate um, coverage and uh, 
bring uh, coverage to uh, dead spots. So uh, this is uh, would give a, a much higher performance, uh, uh, specific performance uh, that uh, could be leveraged by uh, customers that need those need those services. And maybe Alexander, you want to give a little bit of color on that? No, that uh, sums up. Uh, uh, we have gone through the development of the prototype of this trailer. Uh, we needed to close the coverage gaps, and uh, uh, we're in a position to. Uh, depending on customer needs, uh, address that uh, uh, through, through these type of the solutions. Uh, we did a little bit of analysis over the, the kind of main pipelines in the Northern Delta, and it seems that in most of the places, uh, we should be able to have the uh, uh, coverage through our current public network. But we're not saying that it's 100% <laughs> in the context of this application. So yeah, there's a plan to, to kind of uh, 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 build uh, uh, more trailers uh, uh, after the other the other thing that uh, air, air market is looking at uh, testing here in the coming weeks is uh, the ability to uh, send um, position data using satellite and the uh, same frequencies with LTE uh, that's that's the backdrop um, that's plan C if you will uh, to bets which potentially could solve uh, the ubiquitous connectivity issue. Um, but that's a technology that we're, we're going to proof of concept in the coming weeks. So hey, it's, it's Morley here from EDTT. Um, in mid flight, if the drone loses uh, cellular connectivity, does that interrupt the flight or what happens in that event? So there's a couple different things. The, the long-term goal is we want to manage that through the UTM software without getting too far into the details. There are a few options that we can do. And one of the things is if the entire automated mission is pre-planned in the UTM software, in the traffic management software, it will be able to finish on potentially the mission. Um, those are fun details that we have to sort out as we get into the next three while, three years of the UTM trials, but definitely uh, cell, cellular connectivity is something that we're working on right now. We experience a lot of connectivity issues. We're dealing on coming up with a solution of, of working through it. So today we don't have an immediate answer, but we plan to come up and develop a con ops for solutions for cellular connectivity, a loss of C2 link over the next two to three years. And to add a little bit of color to that, uh, Alexander hinted towards it is we are, we are working to build uh, 3D models and connectivity uh, models so that we can, before flight happens, we can predict where we're gonna have um, coverage gaps or uh, uh, coverage problems. Um, the, the other reason that we wanted to showcase that we're collecting the LTE data is that will help make that modeling rich. And we are also exploring the ability to do that in real time, to be able to have a feed and link with uh, TELUS to say what is actually happening on Tower 1851 uh, today. And uh, then we can give that management uh, Air market will be able to provide that real-time management of connectivity. So it's a managed service to ensure uh, flight is, is supported for aviation purposes with connectivity uh, C2 links. Is that making sense? Does that answer your question? For sure. I mean, uh, it, it, it's a work in progress and, uh, you know, it's uh, one of the, I guess, the challenges that still has to be uh, resolved, but uh, it, it certainly, um, it, it sounds like you guys acknowledge it and, and are working towards, you know, plan A, B, and C as, as kind of backups for for every eventuality. So it sounds good. Yeah, it brought a, a thought to my head is actually in some of the testing, uh, we did a 20 meter circle and what we found out is it actually connected to, I think, 12 different towers or 10, eight different towers in that, um, in the, inside that circle. So testing, 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 and we don't even know where the, where the issues could be or will be.
but we have to use the energy UTM trials to do that uh, detailed testing to be able to prove and, and deliver the reliability that our regulators will demand yeah. and that we need to demand. So, so, something that wouldn't be possible uh, without a partnership with TELUS is this level of testing. We just wouldn't have access to this information otherwise if we were doing this independent of TELUS. Um, when Lindsay is talking about these demonstration flights, we have a couple talented uh, people at TELUS, uh, Alex Inescu and, uh, and Eddie, Eddie Huang, uh, helping us out working real time in the background, looking at what's going on with the LTE network. And I just wanted to give them a lot of credit because they've been doing a lot of work in the back end, helping us out, figuring out a lot of this thing. And when we're talking about the trials, I mean, there's a lot of things in the hundreds of hours we have to figure out. The cellular connectivity is almost the first step that we have to figure out before we can even figure out how to fly the drone 500 to 1,000 kilometers. If we can't maintain that cellular connectivity, um, we're going to have a tough time getting, getting to the end game. So there's a lot of things uh, working out, but I just want to acknowledge that TELUS's uh, involvement and participation and cooperation is very, very, very important to us. And... Anything else? Is here, Alex? Do you have anything to add? I just wanted to add a, a quick point on, on maturity, especially on coverage. Um, hi, this is Alex Ionescu from Telus Team. Uh, I'm, I work in part of our technology strategy and research and development division. And coverage is, is always going to be an issue, especially if you fl fly in new corridors or new areas of interest. But definitely the maturity of LTE and the capability that we have with our uh, RAN vendors and moving into 5G offers an excellent upgrade path as well as maintenance model compared to having to pull your own network to cover an area. So to the point of coverage, if there is not coverage in an area, definitely that will always be a continued discussion with customers on use cases to bring up a new tower, to bring up a nomadic cell in the areas of interest that are important for the customers. Thanks, Alex. Guys, anybody, any comments? I really uh, appreciate the questions so far. Sorry, Bruce. Yeah, maybe just, uh, just a quick one. Um, so we have some KPIs on number of flight hours and uh, kind of position reporting. Uh, any initial um, results from that and, and where where you guys have seen uh, potential issues? We have about, I think there's probably somewhere 40 to 45 uh, flight hours we have in, in under our belt so far in testing. Uh, I expect that to at least double uh, by the end of uh, September, uh, if not uh, triple. Um, the flight air is, I guess the, the KPIs is, we do see the hardware. Uh, we're, we're, right now we came out and uh, bought hardware that is, uh, it's a step above, it's pre-commercial hardware. And so... We needed to vet the idea, the, 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 the vision. We've done that, and now we're going to be moving into uh, commercial-grade, um, long-endurance, um, engineered hardware, and to be able to facilitate those long hours uh, that is going to be needed. So I think what you're asking is, what, what little road bumps have you uh, experienced along the way? And I'll say uh, hardware. Is that, Bruce, am I answering your question? Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I think the approach you're taking, um, obviously, again, starting slow, and that it, it, everything is connected, and making sure that you can fly uh, first, and, and then kind of moving to commercial grade, really pinpointing uh, kind of a perfect, um, uh, perfect positioning, perfect uh, uh, flight is is the way to go. So, anyways, I thanks again for for putting this together. Uh, I think the picture says a thousand words, and uh, video is ten thousand or whatever. So. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bruce. Um, gentlemen, it's one o'clock. It's uh, twelve o'clock. Sorry, eleven o'clock. You can tell them in a different time zone. So eleven o'clock. We said it one hour.
people are dropping off. Um, any last questions before you finish up? Let's see any last points. No, I, I'm good. I think we uh, satisfied exactly what we uh, said we were going to do today. And um, I'm ecstatic of uh, everyone participating and coming to hear what uh, Air Market and TELUS are doing. So thank you very much, folks. Everybody, thank you very much for participating. Have a great weekend. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Thank you so much. Thanks again. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you very much.